Okay. Anybody online? Can you hear me? Yes, sir, you're audible. Done. Are you speaking? I'm not able to hear. Yes, sir, you're audible. Siddhanth, Anushka, can you speak something? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And you can hear me, right? Yes, yes sir. Yes. Okay. I don't know how to get this to work. Anybody who has attended lectures in this classroom? Yes. So this works, right? Right, no, it's not working. It is, seems like there is no connection from this board to this. So those are online. You will be able to see my boards, but I may have difficulty seeing you. So we will see how to get that work. Can you confirm you can see the board? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, fine. Okay, so at least one half is working. <laughs> So this is fine. At least I can see thumbnails. Okay, so I think we can start. Welcome to this year's Omega trainings. As you may have already shown some details about how this training works since last year. So every Sunday we will meet uh, in in the classroom, and it will be hybrid. So you can join from home, but as far as possible, if you can travel and join in person, that is better. And uh, uh, you are already attempted the selection test paper. So you have some idea about what kind of questions are involved in Olympiad and very different kind of questions than what you typically encounter in school mathematics, right? So the focus, before even we start the lecture, we need to understand what is the focus of your uh, studies, what you need to prepare, how you need to prepare, because it's not like you just need to read textbooks and solve the, you know, whatever problems are given at the end of the chapter and that will be sufficient to prepare for Olympiad. It's a very different treatment that you need to uh, go through. And for that, first thing is you have to be interested and curious about mathematics. That is the first basic requirement that if you see a new problem, after you solve the problem, what is the next thing that you do? That is the most important question. That are you, is your interest or curiosity provoked by that problem that, okay, I want to try this idea, I want to try that idea. 
and what new properties you can discover on your own after you solve a given problem. So that is the most important aspect of how you study for mathematics, and then that will help you to prepare for Olympiads. Okay. So with that in mind, uh, you know the question paper which I shared on Google Drive. So how many of you attempted that question paper and uploaded? Okay, I see a few hands, but everybody didn't do that. And even as far as what I see, around 10 or 12 students have submitted. Uh, and I don't know how, how many are going to join. So we have 10 participants currently. So 10 online and 6, 7 offline. So of the 17, 18 students, only 10 or 12 have submitted the that assignment. Okay. So that that is the first problem you need to address. That if you have any questions coming towards you, are you taking the time to attempt them? Not just in the exam, after the exam is done, not post post uh, match analysis. That is what you can call it. You know, after the one day match is over, the players go home and what do they do? They don't immediately start preparing for the next one. They first analyze what happened in that particular game. What was correct? What did I do, do correctly? What did I do, did not do correctly? If you understand these things, then you can improve yourself. Okay. So for that, what we are going to do is actually look at that question paper once more. Uh, and uh, try to find out that are the questions really difficult that you would not do them in that one and a half hour. Maybe that I can understand because there is time pressure. You know, you have to get the numerical cal calculations correct. But after going home, after you have enough time with yourself, even after that, I feel that you can get all the questions or at least 14 out of the 15 questions. The very last 15 question, maybe it is significantly difficult. But the remaining 14 questions, every one of you can solve it if you give enough, you know, sufficient efforts. So that is what I want to show first, that how you are supposed to improve your thinking ability with the tools that you already know. So what I'm going to show is that what the theory which you have already learned so far, have you really mastered it? Or, or you only know some properties and you know a few basic problems? Can you solve really difficult advanced problems using the basic ideas? So something as basic as uh, formula for GCD or LCM. Do you know really what is GCD, what is LCM? So these are the questions that you have to think about. And uh, as, as far as possible, I would like you to submit your solution, your approach, so that I will only give you the hint that this is how you are supposed to think. But you have to spend the time to find out uh, what is the right approach for every question. And the second important aspect why I wanted you to submit that assignment was uh, to see how well you are able to write your solution because this is one more problem. See, if I come to your desk and ask you, you may be able to explain it very nicely to me. But uh, finally, you are going to write a written exam, right? So you should be able to write your ideas properly on paper so that the examiner has a clear idea that what you are trying to say. So with that in mind, uh, also it's important that you write the detailed solution of each problem. Okay. So with that, also, one more thing I want to mention. So this year's course, I'm planning to run slightly differently than every year in the sense that so we only did once a week, but what are you supposed to do for the rest of the week? So generally, each year I give some assignments, problems for you to do at home so that you will have to do anyway. But I will also have you watch one more lecture. OK, and what is that? So I will be uploading that to YouTube. So as you know that this activity has been conducted in the last couple of years also. And all of those video recordings are there on YouTube, even right now. So you can go home and watch the last two years, all the lecture videos. But the only problem is that those videos are, you know, in the class what happens if I give you a problem, I'll give you time to think for half an hour. So for half an hour, nothing is happening in that video. That is not a very fun experience to watch, right? So what I'm doing right now is I'm just editing and you know, removing those middle parts. And somewhere if I have forgotten to add one point, you know, I can edit it and put it back. So like some reformatting of the videos I'm doing currently and I'm uploading them back to YouTube. And so basically you will have one or two videos to watch every week apart from my lecture. So you can say that we meet in person every Sunday and remotely you're supposed to watch the video as if you're attending a lecture, maybe one or two times every week, depending on the schedule. So there is no fixed uh, timetable as such. But you are supposed to watch those videos offline. And uh, generally speaking, what I'll do is the theory part will be covered in those videos. So uh, I will be able to spend more time solving problems in the you know live session. That is how we can structure it. And of course, any doubts you have, any other observations you have from the videos, you are you can bring them to my uh, attention. Okay. 
but uh, important thing so maybe if that video is one hour duration how are you supposed to watch it ideally that one hour video you should take three hours to watch how is that because if i ask maybe if i write a theorem and i will immediately start proving it but what you are supposed to do pause the video like a live lecture so pause the video take your time i will not every time say now pause the video it is your responsibility to know that okay this is a good time to pause let me think let me try something on uh, if i get it on my own that's the best thing if i get stuck somewhere or i don't know how to make progress unpause the video watch on a few couple of minutes and so once i start writing the proof you will get some hint oh this is how i can approach this problem again pause the video so as much as possible uh, don't watch the video like you watch some netflix series okay it is not for your entertainment it is a lecture so pause at every moment and try to apply your own thinking and if you have found as maybe that you find a solution which i have not covered maybe you have a different approach to solving that question that is what we are really interested to know not that uh, are you able to understand what i am saying that is not the difficult part the difficult part is are you able to come up with your own ideas or your own approach to solving this problem okay so try doing all these things and most important is to submit those assignments or whatever like problem sets i upload because i need feedback i if i want to help you i need to know where you are currently which areas you are facing difficulty if i have this information about you only then i can help you right so that is the most important okay okay so with that maybe we'll start with the very first question so i don't Number two. Let it this time not start. So the first question was we have to consider. Real numbers x y z such that x plus two y and we have to find the smallest possible value. so firstly how many we have to solve this question in exam time 3 4 5 okay. and online can you raise your hand online who are able to solve this question okay 1 2 3 maybe even more okay so uh, that was during the exam right what about after the exam after you went home and you have enough time anybody who could solve the question after you went home Okay. So anybody who solved the question in the exam or afterwards, how did you approach this question? And don't just tell the solution. See, the another important thing that we want to discover is not what is the solution, but how we are supposed to think about that idea. That is the more important thing, right? Not just what is the solution, but how we are supposed to start thinking. So, what is the first thing that you would like to observe, anybody? We will solve the problem. How did you start thinking? Why did you think that? Let us do this. What is the motivation in your mind? That because if we give that idea some name, right? We can call it some problem-solving technique. And then next time we see a problem, we can consider whether we can apply that technique to that problem or not. And how many different solutions do you have to this problem? That is also something I'm very curious about. So anyway, online, Adya. Yes, I can answer. Yeah, just a minute. Adya? Uh, sir, since we wanted x square and y square, I thought that we should first eliminate z. Right, correct. Because we, if we can eliminate z, because z is not required in the final x square plus y square. So we have three, three unknowns and two equations. So we can get rid of z first. That could be the first step. So that we'll get some expression which has only x and y in them, right? 
and so that we can naturally do by just multiplying and adding them with the suitable constant so if i multiply this by 5 and this by 2 and add them i'll get 9x plus 10 Eight variables. Let's do something different. Or did I copy the question wrong? Oh, I'm supposed to add. So nine x plus twelve y. Is equal to how much? Twenty five. Right? So this is the equation I get. Now many students have seen because this paper was you know just write the final answer. So you see that here I can substitute three and four, and that gives me the answer. So many students have directly said that three comma four is the answer. But if you don't prove that that is the smallest one, how can you be sure that that is the answer? Right. So uh, as a first step, you can eliminate. Uh, oh no, not twenty five. It's seventy five. So first, you can cancel a copy of three from everywhere, and so what you'll be left with is three x plus four y equal to ten. Yeah, and now I have to find the smallest value of x square plus five. So what can be the next step? Sir, we can um. Find out like two equations using of uh, with x and y, and then we can um, do it. So this is just one equation. We'll have to find one more equation. One more equation using only x and y. Yes, sir. But we, I don't know how to obtain that because we eliminated z. So any x y z which satisfies the original equation, they will satisfy this also. But I think we have enough freedom that you can choose any x you want, and corresponding y can be obtained, right? So, so, I, so what I try to do is that um I eliminated uh, I I used Z and found I found out the equations for X and Y in terms right. of Z. So I yes. found so, out no, y no, that is your yeah that is valid that is the second solution. So we'll come to that after this. Okay. So in fact both approaches are possible. The first idea is somebody said let's eliminate Z and keep everything in terms of X and Y. The reverse is possible. Let us use Z to represent X and Y. So even that approach can be done, but that will be the second solution. But what do we do here now? How do we go to x square plus y square from here? Sir, we can substitute the value of y in equation one to x square plus y square. Yes, correct. So we can we eliminate z to get a equation in two variables. Let's continue. Let's eliminate one more variable. So with this expression, you see, I can represent y in terms of x, for example. So how much is y? Twenty-five minus three z upon three x upon. So now you see, I've captured the entire degree of freedom in x. Any x I choose, that will give me a value of y, and that I can put in this expression now. And so now I have to, what I have to do is find the minimum value of. Find the minimum of x square plus y square, which is this, right? And if you see, this is just a quadratic in x square. And if you have studied some basic theory about quadratic equations, you know how to find the the least point of that equation, right? Okay. And therefore, what we will end up showing is that x has to be equal to three. Okay. So then we get x. In my solution, I did not find the values of x and y. Instead, I just directly find out the minimum value for x square plus y square. Yes, correct. Yes. But first, as everybody understood this solution, this is the most natural approach. Keep eliminating variables until you have the least number of variables to work with, and this is true for not just algebra. Even in geometry, we are going to do this. Okay, whenever you have any question, it has a lot of points, angles. What is the least number of variables required to completely define the problem? So, let us call this maybe least variables technique. I don't know if there is any name. This is such a basic idea that we apply it intuitively. We never think of giving a name to this idea, but it's a very powerful concept that eliminate variables as much as possible, and you get the answer. Okay, I hope everybody has followed this solution. Any other solution apart from this? So Anushka, uh, 
you all have one idea right yes sir yes so can you explain from the beginning what do we do first yes sir so first we have the the two equation that is x plus 2 y plus 2 z is equal to 11 and 2x uh, yeah and 2x plus y minus 5z is equal to 10 okay so i uh, took x plus 2y is equal to 11 minus 2z okay and 2x plus y is equal to 10 plus 5z okay then i uh, used like i solved these using simultaneous linear equations and and i found out the first a uh, first i basically multiplied the first one and mm -hmm. then subtracted the second and then i multiplied the second one and subtracted the first so i got right. y if y is equal to 4 minus 3z okay and x is equal to 3 plus 4z okay okay so just a minute before we proceed so what is the strategy being used here let us understand that the details are not important what you multiply what you subtract the important thing is we want to represent x and y in terms of z so you know you are looking at this as a uh, simultaneous equation where x and y are the only variables and z is assuming like constant okay yes In terms of z, we have obtained x and y here. Okay, that is the idea which we are using. Okay, is that fine? Okay. Uh, so, what do we do after this? Now, the uh, the good thing about this for uh, this like representation is that four and three is constant, which means that two ab when we square it will be cancelled out. Mm hmm. Correct. So we can write x square plus y square as nine mm -hmm. plus sixteen z plus twelve z. Uh, plus sixteen plus nine z square, uh, minus twelve z. Wait, wait. Uh, can you repeat that for me? Yes, sir. So I wrote um, x square is nine plus sixteen z square plus twelve. Yes. Plus twelve z. Yes. Oh, you have twenty four z, right? Oh, yeah. Sorry, twenty four z. Yeah, sir. Just twenty four z, and then sixteen plus nine z square. Minus twenty four square. It's twenty four z. So when you do x square plus y square, the middle term is going to cancel, right? Plus twenty four z minus twenty four. And so what we are going to left with is simply twenty five z square plus twenty five. Correct. Yes. And, uh, what will be the minimum value of this? Twenty five because z square can take the value of zero. So twenty five yes. z square can be zero when z is equal to zero, and then the answer would be twenty five. So this part because z can be at uh, Z square cannot be less than zero, so this part cannot be less than zero. So therefore, the total value has to be twenty. And after you obtain this, maybe it's a good idea to check whether that least value is actually obtained. So what is the value of Z for which this will be obtained? Z equal to zero. And so you see directly if I put Z equal to zero here, I'm getting X is three and Y is four. So uh, although the question did not ask for that, but we see that we can actually find the minimum value of X and Y. To that approach also, okay. So this is a different way of elimination. Where uh, there is a common theme in both the questions actually. Can somebody explain what is the common theme? The the both solutions are seemingly different, but there is one common theme which is there in both questions, both approaches. Sir, so can I say? Just a minute. What is that common theme? Yes, Anushka. Yes, sir. In both the cases, we are I, we are involving Z, but uh, in one case we are totally eliminating it, and in the other case we are eliminating it, uh, it as a variable. So we are considering it as a constant, but Z is used uh, to represent X and Y. That is a very long description of what we did. But what is the common theme? That if I have to say in one sentence or one phrase. Yes, one variable or one parameter. Any so reduce the question to one parameter, okay? Because we have one degree of freedom. So the first thing is imagine like, uh, are you aware of three D three D coordinate system like this? This is a plane. This is a plane. I don't know if you have visited this. Uh, okay. So let me just motivate this idea that what 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 is the mental picture that has to be in your mind when you look at an equation like this? Okay, that is very important. So. In normal, like 2D coordinate geometry, you may be familiar like an uh, equation like x plus.
So an equation like x plus two y is equal to three, for example, you know how to draw it on a you know two D coordinate system. It represents a line, right? Some kind of line. So maybe something like this. So when x is zero, y is three by two, for example. So three by two. And when y is zero, x is three. So this line is what this equation is representing. And so you see, this equation represents one degree of freedom because you have the freedom to choose any one point on this line, right? Any point on this line can be a solution of this equation. So you have one degree of freedom. Suppose you add one more equation, like so let's say two x plus y equal to something. Okay, then that is going to define another line. And along that line, you have one degree of freedom. But when you are solving them simultaneously, how many solutions are you going to get? Only one, right? Because uh, where the two uh, if lines meet, you will have no freedom over there. It has to be that point. There are cases where maybe if the second equation is just the copy of the first one, then the two lines will overlap. But leaving that special case aside, in most general situations, the two lines will meet and you will have zero degrees of freedom over here. So, do you understand this word degree of freedom? Okay. We are not defining it formally, but intuitively do you get the idea of what is the meaning of this great degree of freedom? So, in a very similar way, the question that we did right now. Uh, the equation that we had, the first equation, whatever it was, x plus 2y, what I don't remember. So, how do you visualize this equation? There are three variables, so we cannot do it in 2D coordinate geometry, but can we do it in 3D geometry? Okay, so just like 2D coordinate, you can have a x axis, a y axis, and a z axis. Okay? So, the y axis is going inside the board, remember that. So we cannot draw 3D really, but we have to imagine 3D, right? And so now in this 3D coordinate space, what is this equation going to represent? What is your intuition? Because now I can choose any x and any y, and for that I'll get a value of z, correct? No matter which x and y you choose. So on the horizontal plane, any point I choose over here, let us say I choose this point. Let us say this point is 2, comma 3. So x is 2 and y is 3. For that value, there will be some z which is valid, right? Whatever it is. Let us, let us say the value of x is over z is over. So 2, comma, 3, comma, 4, maybe. This is the triplet of values which is satisfying that equation. And as you move this base point, right? This base point you can move anywhere in the plane. This point will also move accordingly. So what is the surface that this upper point is going to describe? Will it be a sphere? What do you think? Will it be a sphere? Will it be a cone? The two comma three point cannot move, right? It is stage moving. Two comma three. So what I'm saying is, if I move this point to comma three, then along with that, this upper point will also move, right? Because every time you change x and y, z will change accordingly. So actually, it turns out to be a plane. Okay, you know, plane like a table or any flat surface. So it will be like a plane. Okay. So imagine like if I take a piece of paper and I you know, place it at any angle in 3D space, then that is a plane. And the important thing on a plane is how many degrees of freedom you have. So you have two degrees of freedom because I can, if I want to position a point, I, have, I can move it left, right or up, down, right? So in both directions, I can choose the position of that point. So what I say is I have two degrees of freedom. Okay. In another way, you can think of it. Why do I have two degrees of freedom? Because I can choose X and Y separately. No matter which X I choose, I can still choose Y independently. And once I've chosen both X and Y, then that point is located in some fixed position. So that is why I have two degrees of freedom. And so what will happen? Suppose this is my first equation. And suppose I have one more equation like this. 2x plus y plus z equal to y. So that is going to describe another plane. And that plane will not be parallel to this plane, generally speaking. Okay, so suppose that that other plane is something like this. Okay. So when two planes intersect, what do you think will happen? Mm -hmm. They will intersect fine, correct? So let us say that this is that line. So now if you are solving both equations simultaneously. You see that one degree of freedom has gone away for us. Now, whatever points, we still have freedom. That, that point can lie anywhere on this line. But we have only one degree of freedom left. 
that we have to choose on that line. Okay. And now you see if I add one more equation, then a third plane will cut, come and it will cut this line in some point. And then that is why you require three equations and three unknowns. Right? If you have three unknowns, you cannot solve it with two equations because this extra freedom is still there. Okay. Are you getting this visual picture? I mean, I'm just uh, I'm not uh, developing this theory formally right now because that will require a lot of background work first. But just to get the visual picture clear in your mind that when you look at an equation like this, what is the image that should come to your mind? Okay. And so therefore, the what the both solutions that we did currently, they were describing this set, right? This black line using some parameter. So that parameter can be x. In the first solution, the parameter was x. So where we said if the value of x is this, then which point are we talking about? And in the other solution, the parameter was z. So uh, and uh, very similar to the first solution, we could have done the reverse also. Instead of substituting y in x, we could have substituted x in y. And so both x, y, z, all three of them can be used as parameter to describe any point on this line. Okay. So let me give some name to this technique. We can call it parameterized parametric solution or parametric simplification. Just to give it some name, the important word is the parameter that we are using one parameter to describe one family of point. Okay. And uh, this idea of parameter is going to be, we will see that again and again in other situations also. So for example, another situation where uh, you have already learned about the parametric kind of approach is basically a circle. Okay. If you take a circle in a plane, right? And any point on that circle. Okay. Again, if you think about it, how much freedom do you have? Because that circle is like a wire, right? So on that wire, you can choose any point you want. So we can describe the position of every point on that circle in terms of a single parameter, which is this angle. Right? So any angle you choose corresponding to that angle, there will be exactly one point on this circle, correct? So if you choose, and generally we start with the positive x-axis of the zero degrees. So when I say zero degrees, I'm talking about this point. When I say 90 degrees, I'm talking about this point. And 180 degrees and 270 degrees. And after 360 degrees, I'll come back to the same point. But you see again that with one single parameter, I can choose any point on this circle. Okay. So uh, you will visit this idea much more formally when you do trigonometry. But uh, just to motivate that this idea of parameter is going to occur again and again. Okay. Okay, what else? Any other solution? Yes. So what, what's your name? Yes. Okay. X plus Y is equal to 7 plus Z. Okay. And we can we subtract the first equation from second. Then we get X minus Y is equal to 7. 7 z minus one minus one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So basically again you can compute x square plus y right? Okay. Okay. So yeah, okay. Perfect. Yeah, this is also a valid approach because what we are doing, we are want we want to find the value of x plus y square. We are not even interested in the value of x and y. So the second solution which Anulka described, there we actually found the values of x and y in terms of z. But here we don't have to do that also. Just by observing that the middle term is going to get cancelled. So therefore we can directly square them and add and we'll get x square plus y square. But I think the final expression will be the same, right? 25 z square plus 25. Yeah. Okay. Any other solution? Okay, but how do you know that z equal to zero or the best choice? The but so why is it true that z equal to zero will be that point? Luckily, it was here, but may not be always, right? I can modify the question very slightly where z equal to zero is not the point where the minimum is. So I don't know. You cannot always be sure that putting z equal to zero would have given you the minimum point. So maybe you have to think again that why you think 
that z equal to zero would have given that option. After we solve everything and once we get 25, z equal to 25, then we can be sure. But until that point, we cannot be sure, right? Because z was allowed to be a real number, so z could be negative also. So how do you know that by setting z to some very large negative number like minus one thousand, maybe that will give you the optimum point. So we cannot be sure that. Any other solution? Okay. There is one more solution which is, I would not say this is a good solution to attempt in exam. Maybe I don't know. Depends on your how much time you. One more thing to mention that every problem has three, four different solutions. Uh, which solution you choose to pursue in the exam can be dependent on the speed required, like how fast, how many calculations are required. Some solution may be very elegant, but very long. That, that is not feasible to do it in a short amount of time. But still, we'll study the solutions for it will show some useful mathematical idea. So that is why even such solutions are used. So uh, just as the first uh, approach when we obtain this equation that 3x plus 4y is equal to 25 and I want to find the minimum of x square plus y square. Okay. So this is how I thought of approaching this problem from here. And you see how every person has their own perspective that for example, I have done a lot of geometry. So my first introduction goes to geometry. At first it's not clear. What is this problem have to do with geometry? But do you see why this problem is a geometry problem? Think about it for a couple of minutes and can you think of this as a geometry problem? So in the coordinate geometry space, what is x square plus y square? If I take any point in the plane, what is x square? Sorry? Circle, no. Circle is the point where x square plus y square is constant. But I'm saying if I just choose any point in the plane, which has coordinates x comma y, then what does x square plus y square represent? So this is a, uh, you know, the play of the mind that there is a hidden extra term over there, but you cannot see that term. That is why you're getting confused. Uh, do you know how to find distance of two points in the coordinate geometry? So if I have point x1 power y1, okay x1 power y1 and x2 power y2. What is the formula for the distance between them? By Pythagoras or distance formula. How much is that? Yeah, okay. So if I complete this triangle, then one side is x2 minus x1 and other side is y2 minus y1. And so the distance can be written as root of x2 minus x1 squared. What is this got to do with this question? What is this x square plus y square? Distance from the origin, or maybe we can say the square of the distance, but it doesn't matter. We want to find the minimum. So if I find the point, whose distance from the origin is the smallest, do you see that that point will have the smallest value of x square plus y square? And so, now do start to see why this is a geometry problem because this is a line, right? So if I draw my x and y axis, this looks like a line, maybe something like this. I'll just draw it roughly speaking. I don't know exactly. So all the points on this red line are satisfying this equation. And out of those, I have to find the one point which minimizes this quantity. So where will that point be? Foot of the perpendicular. And this is a right angle triangle. Do you know enough about this Pythagoras configuration that you can complete the question now? Yes, sir. Yes. And so uh, you can also compute this distance, right? How much is the x intercept and the y intercept you can find from this equation. So this point is where the y coordinate is zero. So this is 25 by three. So this distance is 25 by 3 and this distance is 25 by 4. So you know both sides of that triangle and you can find out. In fact, you know direct formula for this. The This 1 by x square would be equal to, yeah, so if I call this uh, b and c, then 1 by x square is equal to 1 by b square plus 3 by 6. 
So right now it took us 10 minutes to develop this idea. But as a student, as an exam preparer, that's not a term, somebody who prepares for an exam, if you can internalize this logic and finish it in 30 seconds, then you have solved the problem in 30 seconds. As soon as you see this equation and you see this, immediately it may take a lot of time for me to talk and explain or for you also to you know explain it to somebody else. But our thoughts travel was faster, right? In your mind, that x square plus y square. Okay, it's a distance from the origin. And this is a line. And the intercepts of the line are this and this. So therefore, by this formula, I get the answer. It has faster than that. And if you want to do well in an exam like JE, typical JE question will have four or five such small problems put together to be solved in two minutes. So then each small part, if you spend five minutes to solve this one small part, you will now finish the JE paper. Okay. So do you understand how you can have a very different mode of thinking for the same question? Okay. Any doubts in this approach online? No. Okay, fine. So I mean, we have spent a good amount of time on just question one, like more than 30 minutes. I was hoping to finish all the problems today, but if we go by this speed, we certainly not finish it. So maybe I'll skip a few problems. I will not have to discuss every problem, but take a note, like what are the various solutions we observed so far? Write down your observation that how the same problem has multiple approaches and each approach has something new to teach us. Okay, so this phrase, I learned that. What did I learn from this question? And you have to do this for every question you solve, not just this question test paper. What did you learn from every question? We have 15 people online. Okay, so can I get everybody's name because I'm not familiar with it? Yeah. Yeah. I will I don't remember everybody's name in first attempt, but hopefully we'll get to know each other. And which standard are you in? So who are in ninth standard? Okay, who are in eighth standard? Who is in tenth standard? Okay. I think there shouldn't be anybody from eleventh standard, but maybe online is there anybody from eleventh standard? Oh, okay. So then, okay. So this is one difficulty, which is that every student is slightly at a different point that we think they have seen before, they have not seen before. Uh, in general, it is very hard to you know get uniformity that way. If the smaller the class, the easier it is to make things uniform. But the larger the class, it is the the, the divergence keeps increasing, right? The the best student and the worst student, that difference keeps increasing. The larger class that we have, but we, as far as possible, we try to stay together. So any anything which I am covering, which you realize, okay, I have not done this before. Uh, you can bring it to my attention, maybe during the class or after the class. Like for example, coordinate geometry. I don't know if everybody is familiar with basic distance formula, coordinate geometry. If anybody has not seen these ideas before, uh, I can refer you to some books or some material. I will not cover everything. Like everything that is missing, I will not necessarily cover but I will indicate some sources. Okay, then question two. So question two was that pyramid question, right? Yes. Okay. So, so the thing is 3D geometry is not actually part of Olympiad as such because we don't have 3D geometry questions in Olympiad, but that should not stop us from exploring a question. It is using the Pythagoras theorem. There is nothing more difficult than that being used. So, how many were able to solve this problem either in the exam or afterwards? Okay, many of you were able to solve. Uh, so, what is the answer? 11. 11. Okay. Yes, sir, even I got 11. Okay. So, so, how do we start to approach a question like this? We have to find the radius of the smallest sphere that will contain the whole pyramid. Which means that that sphere has to pass through all the vertices. It's like a circumcircle, right? Like a triangle has a circumcircle. So a pyramid will have a circumsphere. Okay. So, but this is what I want to ask you. 
yeah, you solved the question, which is very good. But did you stop there, or did you keep thinking that just like a circumsphere, will there be an in sphere, a sphere that is inside and touching all the sides? Will it be there for this pyramid? Will it be there for every pyramid? This kind of questions, and then how do you find the radius of that in sphere? Did you anybody try to find the radius of the in sphere? So this is how you are supposed to start exploring. Anybody online? Have you thought about the in sphere? And luckily, this is a symmetric you know, diagram. So you can imagine that most likely there will be a sphere. It will touch all the four the the sides of the pyramid as well as the base. Okay, so this is your homework. Try to compute the area radius of the in sphere. So uh, I don't think this problem has many alternate solutions. I think one idea which you may have applied is that if I take the point, so clearly the center of that sphere has to lie on this vertical, like the middle of that diagram somewhere here. And so if I call this radius R, okay, I want to find the value of this R. So what I can do is I can just look at these three points. If I call this A, B, C, then A, B, C form a triangle. And that point, that circumsphere, the center of that sphere, is going to be the circum center of this triangle ABC also, because it lies in the same plane. That is why. In general, you see that's not true. If I have any three points in the plane, how many spheres pass through these three points? Infinitely many. If you see, there is only one circle which passes through all three, which is called a circum a circum circle. But there are infinitely many spheres. Because what I can do is I can take the circum center of these three points, and on that line, any point I can choose, and that from that point, all these three points will be equidistant because of Pythagoras theorem. So any point on this line can be chosen as a center to pass a sphere passing through all three points. So then, how many degrees of freedom do I have to choose the sphere? One degree of freedom because I can choose that center anywhere around this line. Okay. So try to internalize this idea of degree of freedom. You know that is a very intuitive and useful concept for a lot of mathematics. Okay, degree of freedom. Okay, so but leaving that aside, here uh, we don't have that problem because that uh, we know the center of that sphere also lies in the same plane. So therefore, if I find the circum radius of this ABC, that will be my answer, and then that you can find with whatever techniques that you know. Okay, there is one more way to do this problem, yeah. which I mean it's not a very different way as such, but just to show another approach that again you can use 3D coordinate systems. How? So you can choose this point where the the center of that base square has my origin. Okay, so consider this kind of a coordinate system. Okay, where this is my x-axis, positive x-axis. This is my positive y-axis. So positive y-axis is in the plane of that uh, square, but going behind. And then this is my positive z-axis. Okay. So under this system, can I give the find the coordinates of all the points of my pyramid? So for example, what will this point be? So it is on the positive z-axis. So the x and y coordinates are both zero. Okay, so this point is zero comma zero comma twenty. Okay, and for example, this point C can be written as six comma six comma zero, because it is the length of my square base is twelve, so half of that is six. So starting from the origin, I have to travel six units in the x direction and six units in the y direction, and no travel in the z direction. That is why this point is called six comma six comma zero. And same as what we did before. This point, the center of that uh, circle sphere that I'm looking for, that has to have same distance from this point as well as this point. So you can write a distance formula and equate that, and you get the answer of R. Okay. So this is slightly advanced technique. Again, not everybody may be comfortable with 3D geometry, but it's really not that different from just a natural extension of 2D geometry. Okay, 2D coordinate geometry. But if you are interested to you know study it properly, you are free to do so. But this kind of 3D geometry can be also useful in many questions. Okay, so that was question. methods, slightly different methods. Yes, word. 
Sir, so basically, I took that same point on the altitude as the center, and it has okay. to be equidistant from all the five points. And I yes. applied Pythagoras theorem on tri on triangle O B P, where P is the foot of the altitude from A on the square. Oh, uh, okay, okay. So foot of the altitude. So this kind of one. Okay. No, a foot of the altitude from A on the square, like. Oh, okay. So this was it. Yeah. Okay. Ah, okay. Yeah. Oh, so, and yeah, your labeling is slightly different from that, my labeling. Oh, yes, go ahead. Yes, sir. So if we take o, OA as R, then OP hmm. will become 18 minus R, and BP yes. will be R, and BP will, uh, we'll have to find out, and OB will be R. So using yes. Pythagoras theorem, we can find BP, then, uh, then we can find BC, which is the diagonal of the square, and then yes. we can go ahead. Yeah, yes. So basically, that is the same method which I explained at the beginning. So I didn't explain the details, but everybody understands what Anushka is uh, explaining. So we have to find this OB by setting up the quadratic or the Pythagoras theorem for OPB triangle. Right? So that you can do on your own. Any other approaches? Similarity. Similarity. How? OB line perpendicular by center of this. Okay, yes. Correct. So Okay, let me just draw the diagram. So you are taking an altitude from O to AC. Okay. Okay. Then the angle A O T is similar to angle this triangle. Okay. Triangle A O P is similar to triangle A C P. Yes, correct. Then uh, if you write down the Okay, but I mean, which are the things that we already know? Because we don't know AE, we don't know anything, right? So how do we actually find it? I mean, which which are the things that you know and which you don't know? We know AC, Yeah, we know AC, AP, and TC, but we don't know AO. I mean, basically this similar triangle can be anywhere, right? It could be like this, it could be like this. So how do you make use of the fact that O is the circumcenter? Like out of all these similar triangles, which similar? Okay, so how do you use that? Then A equal to O. Okay, so you have to use that somehow again. Okay. Okay, maybe I'd like to look at your solution in more detail afterwards. Okay, then maybe we can move on to the next question. So which was that? The GCD one, right? So who of you got that question? One, two, three, four, five. And online, many of you did it. So again, we have not done number theory, formally speaking, but everybody knows what is CCD. And some basic properties of divisors, if you just apply them cleverly, that is all we need to do for this question. So the question was, find the GCD, the maximum possible GCD of 63 plus. Okay, so. The important term in GCD greatest common divisor. So forget the greatest. If you want to take any common divisor also, okay, what property will that common divisor have to satisfy? So if I call let let D be a common divisor. So D divides 63 plus n and D divides 62 minus n. Yes. So D will divide their uh, sum, difference, multi uh, product, and yeah, 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 all those things. Right. So, uh, well, this is new notation which we have not talked so far, but this is just a shorthand for saying that D is a factor of this term. Okay? So, instead of writing that whole sentence, I'm just using shorthand. So, basically, if I wanted to write, I could say D is a factor of factor or divisor, and same for this to minus. So this is the important property which Anushka mentioned right now that if there is a, you know, how a multiplication table works, that if you write a multiplication table of D, 
in that table these two terms will occur but along with that the sum and the difference will also be there right if you take two multiples of 5 and you add them you will get another multiple of 5 right and this you know by common sense and you can prove it also with not difficulty right because every multiple is of the form d times some constant right so for example this term is nothing but d times some x and this term is some d times y so when you know, add you will get d times x plus y so intuitively it's not hard to see but what is the significance of adding these two we will eliminate yeah we are eliminating n that is the important thing that we are able to eliminate n by adding these two together so same principle as before try to reduce variables wherever possible get rid of n and so adding them we get d divided 125 and so then that puts natural restriction on what are the possible values of d and then with some trial and error you get it right? d equal to 25 works right and d equal to 125 won't work because the n there are limits on how large, large and small n is allowed to be okay? so that is why uh, you can finish the problem that okay so again i rate this as a very simple problem even if you are not formally studied number theory this is based on some kind of common sense and the idea that i have to eliminate n and now once you understood this idea do you see that i can change the numbers slightly and you can still do the problem suppose the question was maybe 40 plus 2n and 60 minus 3n still you know that you want to eliminate n and you know that if d divides this number they will also divide this number times anything else so i can multiply these two with some suitable constant and get rid of the n okay so one more homework for you is going to be take every question which you have solved not solved or as many questions as you can and try to find your own variation of that question okay if you can create your own new problems you are going to be a much better student and much better problem solver okay take every question and try to add your own generalization some twist take the same theme and try to design another question which uses the same theme or idea the more you are able to do this the easier it will be for you to solve new problems so take this as another exercise for you okay any other observation about this question i don't think i mean it's kind of straight forward right so there is not much okay question 4 let me skip question 4 because i think that is basic combinatorics i if you already know it you have solved it And if you don't know it, then we will learn it sooner or later. So question four, I, I think it's okay to skip. By the way, after the lecture is done, I'm going to send you uh, the uh, PDF which has all the uh, hints to each question. So one or two line hints you will get. So those who have not tried the problem so far, uh, or rather stuck somewhere, you can look at that hints uh, page. Question five. So we have to find all n such that natural numbers. Is that you? Perfect, you. So, anybody? Uh, how many of you have solved the question? One, two, three. Online, who has solved the question? Om, you have solved the question. Yes, you are done. Okay. I have solved up the paper. Okay, that is fine. Okay, so then maybe yes, you are done. Can you tell what is your approach? Okay, so first we can factor the cubic equation. Okay, we factor it. Okay. Uh, we we get two factors n plus one and n square plus twelve n plus eighty three. Okay. Then and uh so uh uh the cubic can be uh, the cubic is a perfect cube, right? Yes. Uh, so either it is a cube of n plus one or n square plus twelve n plus eighty three. Hmm. So you are saying that you can factorize it as m or m square, or you are yes. square or. So we can say that n square plus twelve yeah. n plus eighty three is n plus one whole square. Okay, but you know actually, as so than this step is not yes. Good. Uh, you are you are saying some different solution or using this idea? Sir, wait. Let me just finish because this solution, I think, as so than there is a problem that yes. we cannot be sure that this factorization will go like this only. What if, for example, the factorization is m upon two and two m square? Still, the product will be a perfect cube. So both of them may also be perfect cubes, like a cube and b cube. Yeah, they can be separate perfect cubes also, a cube and b cube. So there are a lot of ways to factorize m cube. So we cannot be sure that how the splitting will exactly happen. 
in fact you know i also did not realize this factorization uh, after it was i think yes or then your or somebody else's paper i saw that you found this factorization uh, so in fact the solution which i have doesn't use any factorization like this at all okay so chairman so anybody else online oh you have a solution yes sir sir first we limit the value of that ex expression so as a coefficient of n is 1 so yes. we limit like a n plus 3 cube okay is a small smaller than this ex expression and n plus yes. 6 uh, 6 or n plus 4 is uh, smaller than this expression and n plus yes. 6 is greater than yes and then we get that n plus that 5 is equal to this equation and then we get quadratic and then we get yes. solution yes correct so your approach is also like this okay so another important concept in problem solving is what we call estimation okay this word is very very important estimation and this will be so useful and so many times it will be useful it will be very surprising for you to realize that how useful this idea of estimation is and what is the idea i am being told that this number is the cube okay and here it is greater than n cube so it this number is going to be n plus some quantity q i don't know how much but definitely more than n and so if you think about it we know the uh, expansion of n plus 1 cube for example so if i write n plus 1 cube n cube plus 3n square plus 3n plus 1 which term is greater this one or this one the given one is greater right clearly term by term if you compare clearly every term of this expression is greater than this one so clearly we have to go even larger n plus 1 n plus 2 n plus 3 so up till what point we have to go n plus 6 or uh, uh, no but to stay below this expression i'm saying n plus 4 yes yes correct but how do you discover why did you try n plus 6 or did you go from 1 to 3 4 5 6 okay. how do you quickly that because that number could be twice Yes, correct. So you have to track the coefficient between two. So any, let's say I am writing n plus k cube, right? Any general k. If I expand this, I know the last term is going to be k cube, right? So I have to compare this k cube with 83. And so which two cubes does 83 belong uh, in between? So that is 4 cube and 6 cube. And actually 5 cube. I mean, it will be what that is. But definitely greater than 4 cube. So therefore, we can directly think of n plus 4 cube. Otherwise, you can do n plus 1 cube, n plus 2 cube, n plus 3 cube. That will take more time. That's one more way of directly choosing the correct cube is looking at this term. Because uh, in this expression, the, what is the full expansion? n cube plus 3k n square plus 3k square n plus this. So this term, the coefficient of n square is 3k. And if we here, look here, it is 13. So again, n plus 4 is 12. 4 3 are 12. So that is just below this term. Okay. So therefore, either way, by trial and error or by some systematic observation, you'll realize that I have to look at n plus 4 cube. And so if I write n plus 4 cube, n plus 4 cube will be n cube plus 12 n square plus 48 n so if i say my given expression is s then this is clearly uh, smaller than s correct because term by term every term is smaller than s and so now if you look at the next term n plus phi cube if you write how much is n plus phi cube n cube plus seventy five. So here, you know, some terms are smaller, some terms are larger. For example, 13 is smaller than 15, but 95 is larger than 75 and like that. So we cannot clearly say whether this is greater than or smaller than S. But if you go one term after that, so N plus 6 Q, how much is that? So again, if you compare this with the original, you see that this is definitely greater because 13 is smaller than 18, 95 more than 108. 
so therefore this is greater than s so you do see that s is trapped between these two perspectives so if i were to write this in a different way this will be n plus 4 cube is definitely smaller than s and that is also definitely smaller than n plus 6 cube and this is the you know good thing about natural number that there are only finitely many of them that between these two cubes there is only one thing which s can be which is n plus 5 cube and so therefore if there is a solution the only possibility is that this is equal to s and maybe in some question you have to do more trial and error like luckily these were just consecutive but maybe in some question it is written n plus 4 and n plus 7 then you have two values to try but still it is going to be very small like finite number of attempts right okay does everybody understand this principle uh, i mean the other calculations i think you can do uh, after that actually finding the value of n i think uh, it's yeah because n cube will cancel you get quadratic in n and you get n is equal to 3 and 7 3 or 7 and you can substitute and verify that these are the two solutions so the answer was 10 yes oh this was your approach as well right yes sir okay So again, the solution are the details. The strategy is important. The strategy was estimation. That you estimate that this looks like a perfect cube between two other cubes. And therefore, you can get a problem. So I think that these ideas, you can easily come up with your own creative approaches to design a problem based on this concept. So try to create one estimation type problem now. It may be perfect square, perfect cube, something else. You know, this is a very rich family of problems that you can create on this. Every year, there are many problems of this kind in every exam, like pre RMO, RMO. Every time you have problems like this. Because it's a very common theme in number theory, actually, particularly in number theory, because the fact that integers are finite is exploited very nicely over here. See, if the same question about was n as real number, you see, it's basically, there are infinitely many real numbers or even rational numbers. Even rational numbers between 4 and 6 are infinite. So there it becomes harder to make progress. But for integers, this is very convenient. Right. Okay, so this was question five. So now just pause and think. So we have finished the first five questions. You had one and a half hour to complete the paper, right? And I think the cutoff was 10 marks. So anybody who got more than 10 marks has, was selected. So basically what that means is that if you spent your entire time on just the first five questions of two marks each, and you got every question right, you still would have qualified. And so that leaves you with how much time for each question? 90 minutes. So you have 18 minutes for one problem. If you only do the section A. Okay. So if you give yourself 18 minutes of time, can you do these problems? Okay. That is the first question you have to ask. But of course, the paper was not only the first five questions, it was the entire paper, right? So if you calculate how much time you had per question in 90 minutes time span, you had 50 marks paper to attend. So like roughly 1.8 uh, minutes per mark, right? 1.8 minutes per mark. So you have 3.6 minutes for one to mark question. So side thing in as a question ala That is the expectation. That is the ideal. I'm not saying that you have to, that is the necessary and minimum criteria, but the closer you try to reach for that goal, take a side thing in the char winter, first minter deal. So that is the ideal for which you have to try. But it's okay. I ultimately, you know, pre-RMO is just the clearing stage for the next paper, which is RMO in you know, where you have definitely a lot more time to think for this question. So don't take too much, you know, time pressure. The important thing is, are you able to practice the question? It's okay, so that was question five. So out of the remaining questions, maybe I won't discuss all of them because we have only one more hour left. But let me just quickly choose a few questions which are worth discussing. And the rest you can, as I said, I'll send you a, a PDF which has the hints to all the questions. But your homework is this, that of course you will, whatever questions you could not solve, you will look at that PDF and take a hint and solve them. But try to design your own questions. Okay, so this is your next assignment. That submit a few, your own original questions based on whatever things you are seeing in this paper. Okay, that is your assignment. Okay, what about question? Well, this the the tiling question, the five tiles, right? Which you have to place. And so, have you played the game Tetris? Anybody? 
it is very that in our like when i was in school we used to get handheld smartphone was not a thing right so we used to have similar to the smartphone have you seen those handheld game boy consoles i don't know so those were the handheld tetris games so that the bricks you have to fall the bricks and complete the lines have you played anybody was it nobody else knows about this tetris my channel that you know that completing the lines so we have basically blocks of like four four tiles use four tiles to create the blocks right so you have like tiles like this tiles like this hello so yes oh, sorry actually my microphone wasn't working so um, and i was disconnected so could you explain the last question uh last question means the question before this no yeah uh, that uh, the estimation the question five you are saying yeah so i was just going to who is speaking i don't know who is talking who is speaking hey, it's me very good so who who are you <laughs> so i'm sudendu i couldn't hear for the last uh, 10 minutes okay. So. okay but you know actually we want to able to spend time to revisit that but uh, yeah one more thing to mention all the lectures are going to be video recorded uh, they are being video recorded and it will go live on youtube okay so you can go back and watch the youtube recording and so any part that you have missed you can go back and revisit okay okay sir thank you sir my guys are starting to hurt you maybe next time remember to conduct the lecture in that class okay but i hope you can still hear me yes sir i don't know which which part has the mic does both of them have the mic or I, I hope you can hear me. Okay, so this question, basically, the question was an extension of this. So, if you use four tiles, you can form this kind of bricks, right? How many bricks can you form? Can anybody enumerate? Uh, like this. These are all right. so five five possible states can be formed using four tiles okay so this is what the that tetris game used to be come one more question okay my let me draw it again let me look like it okay uh important thing that was given in the question is that if you rotate the tile it is still counted as the same tile so this and this is not a different tile right because you can rotate it but these two are still different because although they are mirror images you cannot rotate this to form this one right so therefore these are distinct but this is identical so using five or uh, using four blocks you can five form these five shape and so the question was what if you add one more tile so you have total five tiles to work with then how many shapes can you form that was the question so how many of you got it right i mean actually you don't know the solution answer right so you don't know whether you got it right or wrong what is the answer i also don't know answer how much did you get like what are, what are your answers my answer was this question was right 20 so i got 20 as the answer did anybody get 20 more i think most people got less than 20 maybe somebody got more than 20 but they clearly counted it wrong but the question is yeah adhyan what is your answer uh, i got 20 you got 20 okay so the question is how to count this systematically because if you just start to like randomly draw the blocks there is a very distinct chance that you will miss some possibilities or you may over count and you won't even realize that you are over counting so how do you exactly count that set so actually this question is more about discipline more than anything else like how do you do it systematically so that you don't miss any possibility how do you do it in a disciplined way so the idea can be why why don't we start with these five blocks because uh, uh, this five shape because i want a shape which has five tiles so i can start with a shape which has four tiles and i'll just add one tile to it in some direction but i have to do it systematically i cannot do it randomly so 
what I can do is like this. Let me first draw those five times over here, the, the shape that I already know, right? Okay, and we'll take every shape and we'll add one tile to it. And we have to count how many positions we can add the tile. So for the first shape, like how many different variations we can generate starting from that. And let us be systematic, let us go counterclockwise starting from the right. So maybe the first position where I'll add a new tile is here. Then the next position is here, 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 and here, right? So I'll get five new tiles that way, correct? Can I copy a page? This is the copy page button. This is taking more time than just drawing it again and again. Right. Let me just draw it again. But uh, remind me to learn this properly by next time. So, you know, what are the positions where you can add in your file? It can be here, here. Here, here, one more. Yeah, right. So these are five new tiles that are generated, five new shapes. And after that, if you put the tile over here, you see you are getting the same shape again. So we don't have, and you know, below that also there is no point because any shape you add below, if you just rotate it by 90 degrees, you will get the existing shape. So these are the five possibilities you generated from the this. So can you continue this way? and find all the possibilities. Okay. So this was not so much mathematics as well, but just are you able to do this in a disciplined manner? Okay. And just think about it. If you just did this properly and by the same logic, 1.8 minutes per mark. So you had nine minutes to complete this question. So in nine minutes, if you distract out systematically, you'll get five marks. So that is half the cutoff actually, if you think about it. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to, and I'll also do it side by side. We'll keep on generating. And the important thing is that every time you generate a new shape, you have to be careful you're not counted it already. Because as you go with more complex shapes, it is very easy that one of the shapes has already occurred before. So we have to be more careful. For actually block, it's very easy because there are only two possibilities, right? You can either put it here or here. And after that, any other possibility is just going to be a repetition of what you already done. Okay, because of the fact that the square is symmetric from all four sides, so you don't have to think of the other possibilities also. Okay, then what about this T-shape? So here you can add it here, for example. But if you add it here, do you see this is already counted? So therefore, don't consider this. And if I add it here, is it already counted? Yeah. So you see, Later on, the number of possibilities starts to go down very quickly. But here we can still add it, right? So this is still valid. But uh, the other one, this one again is not valid, right? Again, adding here will not be valid. Okay. What about adding it below? Yes, that will be valid. Yes. That will be valid, right? So. Below we have possibilities to add it, maybe here. This is not counted. And uh, similarly, you can add it here, so you get a plus shape 
places and so again note that the this one and this one they are distinct right because they are mirror images of each other by rotation you cannot get one to correspond to the other okay and then from this one and now we have to be really careful so i think this one is valid no where is it counted already it's not right what about this one this it is counted already where is it counted this one if you rotate this one you will get this shape right because this middle line if you imagine this middle line is the same middle line over here okay so this will not be so this question is a lot of hard work i have to be honest but you don't get time much for that so what is the problem uh, you cannot add it here right because it's already counted what about this one it is new right i don't think it is counted again this and this shape are different it is same yes sorry it is you are right it is same because you can rotate it by 180 degrees and you will get and so then maybe this is not counted anywhere and then the last one i think it is already counted right this one is going to be the same as this one this one so again don't have to worry about that so in fact here you only got two possibilities right this and this this and this. these are the only two valid all the others were already counted somewhere okay and then the last one so i can start by this one this is this, this is this thing from the other one because it's a mirror image then i cannot add it here because that will be a repetition i can add it here but i think that will also be counted already this will be a copy of one of this one for example then can i add it here no if i add it here this is the same as this step right these two sets are the same Yes. Okay. Then uh, again, I cannot add it here because that will be the same as this rotation. The reason why we eliminated this one. So I think we are done. Can you listen? Yes. There is also. Uh... An L shape that you can make with four tiles. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. I forgot this L shape. So, yeah, I was wondering. There are so many more possibilities. Oh. Yeah, yeah, you're correct. Even I forgot. Yeah, so actually there are two more shapes which can be formed using uh, just four tiles. and they will also lead to new shapes but again like the number of new shapes you'll get will keep on decreasing now right so which are the shapes you'll get using these ones which are not already counted so you can add one tile to either end like this one and this one that will be one shape uh, you so can add a tile already already counted. it's already counted it's already yes. counted so this is already counted you can add a shape like this So you get a U shape, for example. You can get a larger L shape, like this. Adding this, 
but apart from that i think everything must must have been counted no there is one more step it is not counted is the this one right this kind of zigzag l is not counted and same with this one also so from this one the other shapes will be symmetric but this last shape will be unique actually So this question is really trial and error, but very systematic trial and error, so that you don't miss any possibility. And this is also very important in mathematics. It's not that always it's about logic. Sometimes it's trial and error, but doing it in a methodical manner, where you eliminate the possibility of double counting. Yeah. Okay. And so you can count. Hopefully the answer is twenty. If I made a mistake, I don't. But So one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Hmm. Sir, one more larger L will be formed. No, sir. Which step? Which step we have been missed? From from which step are you suggesting? No, sir. I got the problem. So this is the first one, right? Let me check the solution. Which can you fill this one? Yeah. Fill it. This one. This is same as this way. So because if you rotate this by ninety degrees, this line will become this line, and then this shape will become this shape. Right? Yes, online. Somebody saying anything? In my answer, I have twenty. So which one? Some two possibilities I have missed. So which one have I missed? Mm hmm. After the fourteenth one, this one. This is a rotation of this right? because if you rotate this like this. Counter clockwise by ninety degrees. Okay. Shape I'm saying. Sir, in the L one, can we add add one down to the middle one? And the first one you are saying this one? Oh, sir, the last one. Last one. Last four uh four block shape. Can we add one block down in like in the to the middle one? To the middle, middle one. Oh, but no, but if you see this shape will be again because the the if you see here the main part is the T, right? So if you look at the T, T we already covered. So this and this is the same. Oh, then I think there's a mistake in my solution. There are really eighteen only. So I found that. So I, I had accidentally counted this one as different from this one.
So this and this are counted as different. So maybe 18 is the right answer actually. Okay. But I'll go back and check my solution once more if I made a mistake somewhere. Okay, but any doubts in how we approach this question? But adding one tile at a time, you can keep doing the trial and error very systematically. Okay. And I don't know if there is any, you know, direct way of, you know, there is no formula that I know that I can actually say that for five tiles, the answer is this. Uh, I mean, you can imagine that if I ask this question for six tiles, it will take half an hour maybe to find out the possibility. And it becomes harder and harder to verify that your type, the, the position is already taken somewhere. Okay. So then, so by the way, there is one very interesting variation of this which you can design by not taking square tiles. You know, square is not the only tileable shape. There are other shapes which can also be tied very easily. Like any other shape. It can be tied very easily. So I can ask you the question, if I give you equilateral triangle tiles, okay, this using equilateral triangle, then how many distinct shapes can we form? So for example, if I just give two equilateral triangle tiles, then you can form this shape and you can form this shape, but they are the same, right? Because by rotation, one can be obtained from the other. If I give you three equilateral triangle tiles, then you can obtain this shape and you'll realize that this is the only shape you can obtain because anywhere else you try to put the third tile, it is just going to be a rotation. But after four tiles, it starts to become interesting okay? because for example, I could have a shape like this or I could have a shape like this. I guess only these two possibilities, but the number of shapes will keep on increasing that way. But you see, there's nothing special about square. You can have other shapes also. And then you can ask, can you play Tetris with this shape? You know, fit these kind of tiles and complete the lines. Uh, maybe if anybody is interested in programming, you can write an app to create Tetris using triangles, delta. So delta Tetris. Delta Tetris. So maybe. It's a very long name, right? Delta Tetris. What is a nice name for that? Delta. So actually, this is my app. This is on Google Play Store. I designed it maybe six, seven years ago, but it's not under any maintenance. It's just there. But yeah, we can play Tetris with equilateral triangle. Why not? So you see how one question can lead to so many possibilities. Uh, I could earn a lot of money with this if I wanted to. Okay, so that was question 12, right? Which other question can we do? 11, you want to do question 11? Okay. Or any other questions that you want to suggest that you want to cover? Yeah, I think question 11 is a good choice. Question 15, there is definitely I will leave it for a later time because there, I won't say it is, uh, it is difficult, but you know anything. If you are really advanced in terms of applying what you know, you can solve question 15 also, but uh, maybe very difficult for many of you to solve. So we will do that at a later point, but question 11 we can certainly do. So we are considering all pairs of integers such that S is equal to, and these properties are satisfied for some integers. So here A, B, C, D are constants. Okay. So A, B, C, D are some fixed numbers which satisfy the following properties. So the first property is that. 2a is equal to 3c and the second property is that if one uh, pair of integers already belong to the set
then another pair also belongs to set. And you have to find the smallest possible value of a plus b plus c plus d. So yeah, this looks like a very complicated question because there is a lot of information given and how do you put it all together is not clear. So let's do one thing. Let me not solve this question directly. What I would like to do is maybe give a simpler version of this question first, which maybe you can solve on your own. And once you solve that question, maybe you get some ideas that how you can approach a question like this. Okay. So um, what can be a simpler question to ask? I'm not sure how to construct this just in a minute. Maybe I'm not sure. So you know this equation x square plus y square equal to hundred. Does it have a solution? Yes, because you know Pythagorean triplet. So which six eight ten is a Pythagorean triplet, right? So six and eight is the solution of. So basically, hundred can be written as the sum of two perfect squares. Can you give me another number which has this property that it can be written as the sum of two perfect squares? Even if that number itself is not a perfect square. Any number which can be written as the sum of two perfect squares. Huh? So one twenty five. Okay, one twenty five. Correct. Which is hundred square plus uh, ten square plus five. So I can say three thirty. Three thirty. Something. Like there will be many such numbers. Right. So now I am going to ask you if I give you two numbers. Which can be both written as the sum of two perfect squares. Can I multiply them, and I'll get a new number, right? One, two, five, zero, zero. Can this number also be written as the sum of two perfect squares? Yes, sir. Now, are you asking answering for this particular number, for or any such two numbers you can multiply and find that the product can also be written as the sum of two perfect squares? So, in the most general sense, what I am saying that x square plus a square, and let us use some different variables, okay, just to make it easier to track. Let us say a square plus b square is one number x, okay, and c square plus b square is another number y. So the question is x into y. Can x into y can also be written as the sum of two perfect squares? I'm not sure about two, but it can be two with four of x square. Four. Why? So we just multiply the a square plus b square times c square plus d square. We'll get right. like x square. Yeah, you get four perfect. No, but I want two perfect squares, not four.
sir, it can be possible when either of x or y is a perfect square. Sorry, can you speak again? I couldn't hear you. Sir, it can be possible if x or y is a perfect square. Sorry, Adi, actually your voice is very low. What is he saying? It is possible. Yeah. So you are saying if x and y is a constant, something like that. You are saying I couldn't hear you properly. So if you multiply it out, you get basically every possible product, right? A square, C square, A square, D square. So you get four perfect squares, but I want two. Correct. If we add and subtract the right term, which will be the middle term, you can regroup this expression. Okay. That is the idea, and so if you observe that this term AC and BD is occurring here, and BC and AD are occurring here, so therefore I can combine this this together and this together. So I'll get a square C square plus B square D square and A square D square plus B square C square. So I'd like to turn both of them into perfect squares. So what is the right middle term to add to turn this into perfect square? So here it will be two A C B D, right? And I can just subtract the same thing from here. A A D B C. And so if I regroup it, do you see now that this term and this term they are both perfect square. So therefore X Y will be written as A C plus B D square and A D minus. Sure. Yes. So I tried an example, and that I'm getting that there's there are more than one ways represented as a sum of two perfect squares. Yeah, I guess so because you can have the reverse also, right? Instead of yeah, AC minus BD and AC AD plus BC, that is also possible. So will there be only two ways? That's an interesting question. I don't know, but at least two ways are there. There could very well be more ways if we think about it. Yeah, so that's a problem for you to explore, and maybe try some small examples where uh, how many different ways you are getting. I think it depends on the numbers, right? What are the actual numbers A, B, C, D? On case to case basis, you may or may not get more possibilities. Okay. But this pattern, you know, what was the pattern that we already had one solution to this equation, or rather two solutions, A, B, X, and C, D, Y. From that we got another new solution that AC plus BD, AD minus BC and XY. So this you know set of solutions keeps increasing that way. From existing solutions you can do some transformation. You know this was a you know sleight of hand, you know trickery that you add subtract the same term so that you can regroup it. So like using some trick like that, you can obtain new solutions from the existing solution. And that is exactly what this question is about. The question which is asked here. So here what is it saying that is. Some m n are already given to be a solution of this equation. Okay, so m n are n are already satisfying this equation. Then this a b c d have to be some magic constant so that if you just put those values, you get another pair of solutions a m plus b m and c m plus b m. They also have to satisfy the same equation. So finding these magic numbers a b c d is the question. 
that is what the question was about so to get started with this question again i don't think i would complete this but just to you know make some progress so suppose we have found this numbers a b c d okay and if you take any pair m and which satisfy this equation so we have these two pieces of information that 2m square is equal to 3n square minus 1 is given and we also know that these also satisfy that equation so what can we write two times am plus bn square is equal to three times cm plus bn square so both of these things are given to you now start to simplify and see what you are getting By the way, I should only stand here. Otherwise, I don't. Are not in the same of the channel. Okay, so those who are online, you can see me appearing and disappearing as I walk at across the edge of the camera. Okay, so when we expand it, what do we get? Two times a square m square plus two times b square m square plus four times b square m. Okay, then what can we do? We can combine like uh, a square and sorry m square and n square terms. Yeah, first we can eliminate because this information is given to me, right? What happens when I touch it? Uh, I have not understood this mechanism. Where it disappears? I think what happens most likely my theory is that so when I just tap it, right? The the point where you Touch the board is not exact. So suppose you tap at two very near places. Okay, suppose I tap accidentally, my finger touches these two very nearby points. What the board interprets that as that this very small vector. 
and it interprets the speed at which those two contacts happen as the speed at which i want to move and so it's a very it's like 0.0 dividing 0 by 0 so it decides that i want to move in this direction with a very high velocity and that is why it does something like that. i think that is what happens. so don't divide by 0 is the moral of the story so this term and this term can be eliminated because of this right this two a b so that is why that information was given do you see because i wanted to get rid of the middle term to make the question simple okay and so after we eliminate that and we can regroup other things how do we regroup that we can take m square common on one side and n square common so we'll get two times uh, m square sorry what i'll get m square times 2a square minus 3c square and n square times 2 minus something like this any anything else that we can do to simplify this further because one more thing we have can use but we are not used so far is m and n were general solutions of that original equation so can we use this somehow in this now so for example uh, there is minus 1 in both places right so can i just say this is equal to 2n square minus 3n square right and so in fact i can take those 2n square and 3n square also inside the bracket right and so what will i get m square times 2a square minus 3a square minus 2 and let me take this n square term on the rhs is equal to n square times 3d square minus 2d square minus 3 Okay, is everybody following how we got this expression by just rearranging that two m square and three n square terms inside and some rearrangement? Okay, so what is this equation telling us? That if m and n are any solutions of the original equation, then this equation has to be true. And note that a, b, c, d are constants. so m and n can change but abcd will not change so how can this equation be true under what circumstances can this equation be true suppose let us say the term is inside the bracket right suppose these are not zero they can both be zero then it will be zero equal to zero so that is one possibility that this term is zero and this term is also zero then of course this equation will be true so that is one possibility but what if they are not zero non zero terms then that will lead to some contradiction because suppose there are some non zero constants that we call this left hand side cap capital n and this right hand side is capital r So I'm get n square times l is equal to n square times r, which means that the ratio of m and n is also constant, right? But you can just try a few values and see that you have many different possible solutions of that original equation, and every time you don't get the ratio of m and n as constant. So therefore, this possibility is eliminated that they are non-zero. So the only possibility is that the terms inside the bracket have to be both zero. Only in that situation will this equation be always true. so i would say that is a slightly difficult part to imagine that maybe some of you reach this step up to this step maybe many of you did arrive but after that what to do maybe was a difficult but you do follow this logic you can make two cases case one the terms inside the brackets are non zero and clearly if one part is non zero other will also be non zero right otherwise we'll have a situation where zero is equal to non zero which will not be valid so therefore you have to consider the possibility the only case that is valid is that both l is zero and r is zero so how did we conclude that they are zero i didn't get it actually so the two cases i am considering that l and r are both zero or they are non zero right 
Right. If they are non-zero, then what I am saying that m square times l is equal to n square times r. This equation has to be true for every possible value of m and n which satisfies my original equation. But if you look at the equation, like what is the equation? Two m square minus three m square is equal to minus. So, for example, one solution of this equation is I can put uh, m is equal to two, and uh, what is that? Eight, right? And n is equal to one. That's one solution. Yeah. No, not sure. What is one? Possible solution of the situation. No, but these are integers, right? No, m is m equal to one. That works, right? One and one. Yes, n is equal to. So if I choose the pair one comma one in this equation, then I'm saying l and r have to be equal to each other. But if you take any other solution of this equation, so for example, you can try two small values. You will get one more solution. So, yeah, one and minus one also works, but there this m square and n square will not change, right? Maybe n is equal to two. You said and then l has to be minus r, r has to be minus l. Right. Now wait, let me find one more solution of this because I had found several solutions. Not able to remember now, but there are other solutions. So basically, what we have is some other pair where m and n are not equal. In that case, what will happen that l and r, the ratio of n and r will change. So every time the pair you are considering is changing, then the ratio of l and r is also changing. That cannot happen, right? If l and r are constants, then the ratio of m and n has to be constant all the time. So that is where this second case leads to contradiction. And so the only case that is valid is that l and r both have to be equal to zero. Okay, and then then you can start to solve that. If two a square minus three a square is equal to two, and three d square minus two b square is equal to three, then what are the possible values of a b c d that you can get? Okay, so um, maybe spend some time on this problem. Again, you can look at the hint which I but the hint is basically this one. Thing. I'm not doing anything different from here. But again, after this, what to do? Few steps I may have written there. So you can look at that PDF. And that will give you some hint about what to proceed. But actually, this is a very uh, recurring idea in our theory that from a given solution, how do you obtain new solutions? And that you can continue to explore. Okay. Okay. So we are almost out of time. We have only five minutes left. So let me uh, speak a bit about what you are supposed to do for this week. So we will meet again next Sunday. But uh, before that. Uh, I will also upload one video to YouTube and I'll send you the link on the WhatsApp group, which you are supposed to watch. So it's a topic in geometry called uh, power of a point. You know what is power of a point? You know what is radical axis? Anybody of you already heard about this term radical axis? So it, the topic is that only. So as I said, watch the video at home as if you are watching a lecture. So pause at every moment that you can get. Pause and try to solve things on your own and uh, come prepared for the... So next time you'll have some problems to discuss. Which we'll actually discuss in the class, or any doubts that you have, any part which you did not understand, you can ask me to repeat in class. So, like that, let us use our time more effectively. Uh, you know, instead of only doing Sunday to Sunday lectures, use the time in between to watch the recorded videos and come prepared for next time. Okay. Okay, that's all then. Uh, those who are online, also, I hope uh, you are able to hear and uh, like the technical device, that is no problem. With this recording, and again, anybody who has missed the lecture, you can go back and watch the recording on YouTube. Okay, that's all. Then, thank you. Bye. Bye, sir. Thank you. Sir. Bye, sir. Thank you, sir. Bye, sir. Bye, sir. Thank you, sir.